I have two assignments for this afternoon. Uh, maybe we take them in reverse order, or I don't know, whichever order. Um, one is to provide recommendations uh, based on all our discussions and any further thoughts you have uh, that would be for the field of informal science learning as a whole. So what has come from these discussions or that you can bring to the table that you may have been holding back on us, <laughs> but it's all relevant uh, now to trying right. to come up with uh, things that, that our, uh, our Al DeSena will say, this is wonderful. <laughs> These are great contributions to the field of informal science learning. Um, the second piece is what we've been sort of wanting to do for the last two days, which is to help put some parameters on uh, what uh, might be a viable um, national traveling exhibit on the Manhattan Project dot dot dot. <laughs> um, and I would like to propose that we not limit ourselves to, to one uh, concept. That we may want to say, well, here are, here are three concepts, or you know, whatever it seems right, because we can do a little test marketing. You know, it might be that. In, anyway, so I just wanted to open it up, not not to say we have to necessarily all come up with the one thing, but if we happen to come up with the one thing, that's great. But if there happen to be two competing notions or three or whatever, we can then go through an iteration process and get some more feedback on those three ideas. At any rate. Um, <coughs> so, let's see. Who would like to start? Um, uh, which one is now approaching two o'clock? I would say if we take the broader lessons, does that make sense? Take that first or take reverse order? What's that? Broader lessons first. Okay. And we'll give ourselves till 2.30. How's that? To come up with the broad lessons. Doable? Two o'clock? <laughs> How quickly can I <laughs> I, I, I look at you, Alan. I'm sure you have done this a dozen times. Yeah, okay, he's nodding. <laughs> Two o'clock. <laughs> Why don't you get us started? <laughs> yeah, well, well, this is the, 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 the sort of end of the fun stage <laughs> of developing an exhibition. And, uh, and Max done this as, just as long as I have, so he can have some comments as well. But we are all fascinated by the discussion we've just had. I think I can fairly say that for everybody. And we, we are surprised to discover a lot of agreement. Um, and we're not terribly surprised, but sort of challenged when discovering areas of disagreement. And now we're at that nasty place where we have to actually start talking about stopping talking and coming up with an exhibition. So. Um, we are in much better shape than in many topics because we've got incredible expertise gathered together. And it's not just um, expertise in, in having researchers here, but people who have actually thought long and hard about what is it important to communicate. And that becomes, when you start working on exhibit, that becomes a big challenge. Um, we can all agree for even a, a simple topic like uh, I did an exhibit once on um, uh, biochemistry. And we had tons of facts on biochemistry, but when it came to deciding which of those things were important to try and communicate, we got into major arguments. People just did not agree. Um, and so the, the various biochemists and historians of chemistry and uh, chemistry teachers all had very different opinions of what were the essential things to include. The danger, uh, which is what happens with most uh, K through 12 standards, is that you try to make everybody happy. And so the standards become 100 pages long, and they're long, long lists of things. And if you dare leave out any one of them, an entire community rises up to smite you. <laughs> um, I don't, from my, my reading of what's happened the past couple of days, we actually don't have that much of a problem. We, we came, the, the major topics which you had picked in advance 
are the ones everyone feels is important. There was nothing that we sort of dismissed as, well, that's an interesting sidelight, but that's sort of irrelevant to the main story. The problem now will be, um, okay, so, so backing up, an overall conclusion would be that we are much better than average prepared to develop an exhibition. And that the process that we went through the last day and a half uh, really turns out to have been a terrific start. Because I've, I've been doing this for 40 years. I have started many exhibit uh, developments um, with in, in total disarray and disagreement. Uh, so uh, I think one important thing, I, I talked to Kirsten about the evaluation she's going to be doing. And I said one thing would be really to talk to the, uh, we have historians here, we have science, some with science backgrounds, some with history backgrounds, we have uh, museum and education people here, we have parks, energy, um, is, is find out how many of them have uh, new respect for the other fields and might actually call up one of the others for some question that they would not have known to do or felt enough confidence and trust to do before this meeting. Uh, that's very important for these interdisciplinary meetings where we have, we came together for this one topic and we'll probably never talk to each other again. Um, I don't feel that <coughs> came out of this meeting. I think I, many of you are doing things I am and I've made lots of notes uh, that I'm, I want to follow up on because they're going to help me in my work aside from this project. Okay, uh, most of the, uh, any other comments I have would be about the specifics of getting started on the exhibition. Uh, I did though want to, uh, to run one thing by you because it's part of the, the challenge of an exhibition is realizing that it's finite. That is what? Finite. Oh, finite. Oh, finite. Finite in size, finite in time, finite in money. Um, <laughs> yes. And I think I said earlier, you don't want to start off by saying, there's not very much we can do, so let's restrict our conversation. No, that's out of bounds. But we've had a, a, a day and a half of anything goes. So let me just offer a couple of, of uh, two numbers from uh, the great experience of museum exhibits. And I'll ask you to guess. The first number is I'm sorry, start with an assumption. The assumption is we're going to do a really exceptionally performing exhibition. One which in terms of its educational value is in the top 10% of the nation's exhibitions. We have data. Um, let's say it's an exhibit of 15,000 square feet. That's a major exhibition and too big for a lot of places to take. We may not want to do that, but let's suppose we did that. What percentage of the of that exhibit do you think the average visitor will actually visit? Hmm. That's assuming the visitor enters the exhibit at all. Right. <laughs> yeah. Very good. Thank you, Matt. The state is for people who actually entered the exhibit, and this was collected from many different major exhibits. What percentage of the components in that exhibit? Mm -hmm. so I'm being sloppy. I don't know why. Exhibition is the name for the whole physical thing. Exhibit would be a unit. Let's say a unit on radioisotopes or a unit on the decision to drop the bomb. What percentage of the units do you think people will visit? 25? 20%? 10, 20? 5. 5. 25. 25. You guys are pessimists. Oh, I guess for, the, so. for the top performing exhibitions, the top 10% is 50%. Top performance. They will visit half of the units. That's still distressing to many people because they, you mean half the stuff I worked on, <laughs> nobody's going to see? Well, that's not true. It just no, means not true. everyone will see it. But how much time do they spend? That's, okay. that's the crucial but, Next but, question. But even yeah. you, gave us, you said 15,000 square feet, right? Right. That's a, that's a huge that's exhibit. Huge. Yeah, yeah, but it turns out that's pretty much true if it's a 5,000 square foot exhibit well, as well. But see, I can see 50% of 5,000, but 50% of 15,000 is a different 
amount of time that you're actually there. Right. Well, there is an enormous span, and the span goes from well, from zero for the people who don't even go in, to uh, I've never seen a, an exhibit actually that got 100 percent. Right. But up to the 70 and 80 percent for some. And yes, you're right. For the smaller ones, it tends to be higher. Yeah. What were some of the exhibits that got 70 to 80 percent? Um, let's see if I still have the paper up. This is a paper by Beverly Sorrell called Paying Attention to Paying Attention. <laughs> Looked at visitor attention to exhibitions. Um, I'll see if I can pull that up here. Um, but next question is how much time people will spend. So what do you think the average time in the exhibition is going to be? And again, this is a top performing. This is a top performing exhibition. No more than an hour. Two hours. Okay. An hour, two hours. An hour. 45, hour. Minutes. 45 minutes. 45 minutes. Two hours. Any others? I've, I've seen 10 minutes. And that's kind of <laughs> <laughs> Not an hour. Top performing now. <laughs> Top performing. They got to visit 50 percent. But they have, right? to, they have to walk through 15,000 square feet. 50 right, right, right. 50 percent. Okay. Well, the average, and again, this is averaged over the top uh, performing exhibitions. Uh, the average is 100 minutes. Oh. Wow. That's, great. that's the top performing exhibition. Um, for for other exhibitions, yes, it may be much less. I just want to clarify for Arthur that the Smithsonian is a special case because a lot of people come here. It's a once in a lifetime visit to Washington D.C. and they literally put roller skates on to try to see everything. Yeah, to in see one boards day. going through yeah. our. Place. So that's why the Smithsonian cannot be factored in, even though it's a top performing institution. And often, yeah, Thank you very much. and often they're here to check that box, like uh, Heather was saying, Hope Diamond, check, right, right. Flyer, check. Exactly. Uh -huh. So uh, where, where this is hosted is definitely something to consider um, as far as what visitors, what their agenda is for going to that place. Is it a neighborhood place where people have a strong, you know, it's a strong tie to the community, or is it is it a must-see type of location like the Smithsonian? That that all factors into how the, how the exhibit's going to be used. Yeah. I mean, you're assuming this traveling exhibit right. will get um, parked somewhere indefinitely? And no. Have no. no, no, I'm saying depending on where, who hosts it, uh, how it's used at that location. Oh, I see, I see, as it travels around. Right, right. So you may have different results if it's at uh, COSI in Columbus as, as you would in Chicago if it's at the Field Museum. Right. right. So, Ellen, I would think some of those, like, almost 100% visited exhibits, from my experience, has been when I have gone to a Museum of Tolerance or a Holocaust exhibit, because you pretty much feel you're looking at everything. It's there for a reason. It's such a moral obligation, and, and you, you want to look at every single yeah. exhibit that's there. So. But I can't think of anyone out any unless it's something like King Tut, um, where again it's like uh, incredible. The uh, <laughs> were non interactive. <laughs> <laughs> we love them, but a little goes a long way. <laughs> I, like, yeah, I don't like them because I think they're a real representation of anything, but sociologically, they're really interesting. Yeah. Well, my, my only point here is that uh, to encourage us to, as we now start to narrow down, to be realistic in our expectations. 
if we try and say you've got to know this before you can understand this and you've got to know that before you can understand this and we need to expect everyone to spend at least two hours to <laughs> yeah. get the core idea that then we're setting ourselves up for disappointment when we evaluate it it doesn't mean we can't be ambitious uh, but it does mean we need to think hard about prerequisites people have done many things to try and force visitors to go through an exhibition in the right sequence for example, most visitors, if you enter a hall and the exhibit is all around, they turn to the right. Uh, however, some don't because there are a lot of people at the right reading the introductory panel, so they deliberately turn left to the end of the exhibit uh, because there are fewer people there. Folks have tried to force this by putting in big arrows and even having a guard standing there <laughs> from going in the wrong way. But the way exhibitions are used, um, it's not random, but it looks that way often, with people just skipping over the, the part that you know they have to look at first to understand the context of the next. So should you design it so that there's more standalone? I think you... The wandering visitor can, you know kind of comprehend unit A or unit Z, whichever, or in between? Well, you should let others comment. My own preference is yes, that each piece needs to If you just went to this one <coughs> section, you could get a lot out of it. Maybe not nearly as much, but you would get some core ideas. Uh, Beverly Sorrell, whose research I'm quoting here, also came up with a, an exhibit planning concept called the big idea. The requirement is that you state the big idea of an exhibition, 25 words or less, single sentence. Um, and then for each section, you have a little big idea. And her argument is that the, the visitor may never know what your big idea is, but if you don't know, <laughs> you will wind up with a hodgepodge. Yeah. Can I ask Cindy something? Just uh, We're not starting with a blank slate, are we? On this, you've had iterations of this exhibition oh. out before, right? Did you, or do you want to start with a blank slate? I think slate? we should use this group as a blank slate, sure. But I mean, okay, we're not working I mean, with an existing temp. Uh, I'm not visit. promising to do exactly that. No, no. <laughs> but you've already you've already had several iterations oh, of this exhibition. I don't want to impose those. That's my question. I, I that was my that was my I question. I want everybody to think freely. That's yeah, my question. Absolutely. We, we've done some planning before for an exhibit, though. Oh, a lot of thought, right. and a lot of people in this room have contributed right. to those thoughts, but. I don't, you know, they were neither funded nor built. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm open. There may be a better mousetrap. <laughs> I, I was just thinking about a museum exhibit that um, I just think is, I don't know what the statistics are, but I think is always packed, hugely successful. It's the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago. It's called You! Exclamation oh, Point, yeah. The Experience. I mean, I have in my classes self-defined science haters. And you send them to the mm. museum and they find out all kinds of things. They stick their hand in this and see this. They type in data, the interactive parts they really love. But one thing I'm mindful of is that the emotional tenor of that museum is different than the somber museum that you go to to find out about the Holocaust, for example. But this one is literally has excitement, movement, energy built into the title with the exclamation point. So as I've been thinking about how to represent this, I'm also thinking about what's the tenor of the exhibit. Should mm -hmm. it be, is it fun and interactive? You push the button. Or are there different parts of it, some of which are more somber? Are there kind of playful, kind of go shopping and feed your family just at the a &P? Or I don't know what kinds of things like that. Or help them solve the problem. So that that's also to me shaping what I think might be in there about how how it could be approached or what how are people we don't want to tell them how to feel but what's the kind of orienting um, emotional tenor of different parts of things sadness sorrow excitement I don't know but I, I'm taking lessons from what people had said earlier that people like to be you know see the piles and they like to you know do things. So, but it's also not a super happy story in other ways, obviously. <laughs> to 
put it in my students' terms, not super happy. No, if you're tough. <laughs> I think what goes along with that is the fact that we, uh, th those in the science center field, consistently overstate the what the, the learning aspect of the experience. So, uh, you know, I had a, a, a wonderful discussion with a, the new director of the Liberty Science Center uh, in Jersey City, where you know he recently said, I, I disagree with him on this point, but he said sometimes our, our science center has been too relevant. We try to take on the most relevant issues. Um, I, I think you can do a lot with relevant issues. So, I, you know, I, I disagree with him certainly in, in that on that basis. But he also said. We acknowledge that our audience is is younger. We're realizing that our, young, our audience is younger than we have perhaps perceived. So we're going to work down to a to a, a younger audience. Well, he does have a younger audience, but he's still trying to introduce nuclear energy or, or issues of this sort. The the exercise itself is fun. The uh, you know moving balls back and forth and putting hands on things is all fun, but but I defy him to demonstrate that there was actually a learning activity that went on there. So can you keep what we, what we would call the dwell time? Can you, can you hold the dwell time? Because people like stepping in, stepping out, mm -hmm. putting hands on, putting uh, you can. But, but you, th let's, let's be sure we don't necessarily equate that with learning, because it's not always the case. I think, and I don't know if that needs to be decided today, but I kind of feel like maybe it does, is, is where is this going to go? Is it going to science centers? Is it going to history museums, or is it both? Because if it's, I, I, I got thinking about, based on what Angela was talking about, if it's going to a science museum, it needs to talk about how all of these sciences, the engineering, the chemistry, the physics, all came together in the Manhattan Project, and how, you know, even if you're a physicist, you, you still need to be able to work with a chemist and, and those kinds of things. And that is much more relevant, I think, in a science center than it might necessarily be in a history museum. So... When we've talked about this before, <clears throat> one of the, uh, with NEH, I guess, uh, a couple years ago, they loved the idea of using history as a platform to teach science. So everybody wants to teach science, or, you know, lots of money coming in from for STEM education. And you could also trick the scientists in learning a little history. <laughs> you know, it really is a, is a deliberate hybrid that'll be both. And when, you know, our prototype, um, we had, you know, the World War II Museum in uh, New Orleans just very enthusiastic about it, as were the Exploratorium and the Science Museum in, in Boston. I mean, we had, really, I didn't call anybody who was a dad off want that exhibit. Everybody, they wrote letters. Obviously, it was a, a very loose letter of intent, uh, so maybe you can get anybody to write anything, but <laughs> I was impressed that they were, there was a lot of interest, and they kind of liked the idea. Oh, we're a science ex museum primarily, but you know, this will be interesting. I don't know, but this that's is as much a reflection on science center. Uh, with all due respect, I know you, you know this is a great presentation, but it also says something more about science centers themselves. Um, they are re realizing that much more that context is important, that history is important, yeah. that all, and, and so and so they embrace this much more readily than one might think. I don't think we have to drill down so deeply into the basic science principles just because it's a science museum. I think you know we sell better when we have this kind of activity. So, so one one thing that's occurred to me in thinking about what a number of people have just said here about what, and, and this is something that I think has has come up a few times to, to, to us here about whether this is a science exhibit in a history, in a history context or history context and a science concept and things. And also this question about big ideas. You know, what, what's going to draw somebody to this exhibit? And to me, it's, if it's a science, ex if it's a history exhibit, what draws people to the Manhattan Project? Is it because they want to learn about how great engineering is? No. You know, nobody cares about that. <laughs> um, uh, is, is it, 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 it may be end of World War II, that's a big popular thing people are interested in. It may be the decision to use the bomb, which even though historians may or may not be debating it as much, is that the big draw still for, you know, I that's the question I get asked by lay people when I have dinner with them is, so do they have to use the bomb? I get asked that question every time, and I'm sure the other people who work on bomb stuff get, get iteration that and like, so what did Bortel Heisenberg, you know, you just get the same questions over and over again. 
if it's science, the one draw that I think, I don't think people really care how a nuclear reactor works. I don't think they really care, but they want to know how do you make a bomb. Yeah. And because that's the relevant question that people are fascinated by. And I get asked this by, by high school students and college students, how do you make a bomb? There, there's this forbidden knowledge aspect to it that ties into Iran and things. And I, and I just wonder if we would even agree that there are a number of questions that the general public cares about. I haven't done any studies or surveys, so I don't know if they care about that. That's my impression. And if one of those is the way to pitch the, pitch the whole thing, because they don't care about Vannevar Bush and James Conan, even though I do. Hard as that is to imagine, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, but, you know, I might, I, I might um, agree, but partially take take a different uh, approach on that. I, I think that it has a lot to do with age level, obviously, um, and there is an age level that's fascinated with the bomb, no matter what. Um, there is a slightly older age level that says, "Why am I paying what I'm paying for my energy bill again? And why aren't we uh, opening?" More building more nuclear reactors, and what is that debate about? Um, there's 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 that element. So I think you, you know you can extrapolate if you're going to if it's just going to be the nuclear environment, you you can extrapolate to, to those areas. Lower than the I want to build a bomb. It's it's you're almost into basic science principles and what you can show about basic science principles. What I find interesting in a generational sense, however, is if if you did an exhibit that had the Manhattan Project. And next to it, you did, um, you know, like the Liberty Science did on the Twin Towers, on how, you know, what, what was the actual structure and what happened with the Twin Towers? People would walk right by the Manhattan Project. They're, you know, they're going right to, number, you know, impact in history, you can, you can debate, but, but, you know, no one's going to debate that, that the extent to which the Manhattan Project was profound in many ways that, that do not warrant you walking past it. Um, b because because of the twin towers, um, because that's rele relevant to them. Exactly, and, and so there, so that's what we're up against here is, mm -hmm. is the relevance question, and we're reaching a point where, unless you're a historian, the relevance has got to go to a larger message, mm -hmm. and that larger message, I mean. I'm in the field, and it's not that fun. You know, I mean, it's hard to say. You know, why is science so relevant and important in your life? In your in your life, you got to find all kinds of exciting ways to get people to want to talk about that. Um, so if we if we pulled away from the Manhattan Project to well, it's really about science and what it means in your life. That's still something we're going to have to sell pretty pretty heavily. And you just mentioned it again, the age of the person viewing the exhibit, and you mentioned that with Liberty Science Center, and we really haven't talked about this at all, of if it's going to a science center, and we're really thinking this is an exhibit that's going to travel to science centers, they generally have a slightly younger demographic in general. Um, although if we think of it someplace like the National Museum of American History, and that general kind of all over, it's still written at a particular level for people to understand. And sometimes that'll gear you toward what Kelly was saying, so what's the tenor of this exhibit? And if it's those kinds of people that are going to be attending in those venues, what do we need to do to make it approachable for those people in those venues? So it really comes back to a lot of audience research from the get-go and a decision about where this is going to go um, to decide some of these, ans to these, these things about the exhibit. It's good to talk about all these variations because that's what's out there, but you're going to have to decide on one when you come down to constructing it and designing it. Um, do you have demographics from your own museums which are mm -hmm. I do I mean, we do certainly yeah sure, sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and they're around so deciding on the kinds of venues that that's really going to be marketed to in addition to what's the size of their traveling exhibit space you know so to know is it a 5,000 or 15,000 square foot exhibit that we're even thinking about uh, but also the demographics the, the other thing here is that when I'd come back to Alan's what's the, the big idea um, and the big idea and the little big ideas. Um, one way that that's approached that, that does allow you to deal with generations is you'll see a lot of times in a museum something like um, the brain. You know, the, exhibit, the, the, the big idea is the brain and, and aspects thereof. And you, you might have um, representations of, of neurosurgery, you know, advanced representations of neurosurgery on one end and some really basic why you 
why you see and why you don't see at, at the other end, which allows you to, to disperse. But if you do that, the Manhattan Project then becomes a subset of, of a bigger, big idea. Mm -hmm. you know, and so you, you, you accept the fact that there are certain folks. And, and by the way, I had a wonderful uh, discussion with the, the director of the California Academy of Sciences one time when I walked through and I said, you know, the, 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 the level of most of your, your presentations here is awfully high. I said, you know, you, you don't really capture a lot of young people with this. And he said, I don't care. He said, basically, I know my audience, and I know that I have a discerning, interested audience that wants to look at these subjects. If they happen to bring their kids, their kids will see something. The, 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 the pictures will be interesting to them. Some elements will be – but, but I've accepted already that – I can't satisfy everybody. So you got to know your audience. You, you got to know who, and, and where it's going. Supporting. But with that being said, Body Worlds is not a kids exhibit. Really, I mean, it's not a right. seven, eight-year-old yeah. exhibit. Yeah. And you know, science centers all across the country, all across the world, have carried that exhibit. Sure. And science centers are also trying to reach an older demographic. Forty percent of them target senior citizens. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think that you know. An exhibit that that is geared toward an older demographic could work at a science center. It, it it depends on the science center, obviously. And history museums are doing having just the opposite. Our <coughs> audiences are 50 plus, and we're trying to reach down to kids. So. Mm. 